series. I'm really lucky today to be joined by all these lovely people at the bottom of the screen, but especially with our guest, Scott Giles, who is the Legislative and Governmental Liaison Officer for the National Guild of Hypnotists. Scott keeps his finger on the pulse of what's going on at the national level with uh, proposed legislation, and in particular lately, um, he's been watching what has been developing with the latest version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, and he also uh, keeps track of any cases in which practicing hypnotists have legal action taken against them because of an inappropriate use of language or some kind of behavior which would be considered outside their scope of practice. So we're really lucky to have uh, him here with us and get his perspective on what's developing in this one particular area of our professional world and to sort of coach us on how we can make sure that we don't set ourselves up for uh, a stressful uh, legislative uh, legal action against us just for doing something that you know maybe we thought was completely innocent when we did it. So Scott, thanks so much for being here with us today. I'm really pleased to be here, Paul. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, um, so I have. When I started my, when I started my um, practice in 2004, I went out and I bought the DSM-4, roughly the size of the Bible, right? Like, this is a serious... I haven't even Bible, seen... Actually. <laughs> <laughs> and And... Um, you know, I mostly got it because I wanted to sort of under I wanted to get my hands on it, and my eyes on it, and understand what it really does. Um, and I still don't. <laughs> I mean, generally I do, but this is a bulky thing. This is a for people who maybe haven't seen it, held it, read it. Just sort of start by helping folks understand what the purpose of this manual really is. Okay, way back at the end of the Second World War. Uh, the mental health professions needed a tool to talk to each other because there were so many different competing methodologies of psychotherapy. You had the Freudians, you had the Jungians, and so on and so on. So a, a group of, 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 of people, of the mental health professionals, got together and created the first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. And the intention was that this was going to kind of unify the language of mental health care, at least to the degree of allowing practitioners to talk to each other with some degree of understanding about what these different words would mean. And that was a good idea. It then began to go through several revisions. There was a DSM-2, there was a DSM-3, and then a DSM-3R revised, then the DSM-4, and then because of a bunch of hypnotists, the DSM-4-TR that you just held up, Paul. Um, what had happened in the fourth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, there were a couple of very prominent uh, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists who were doing hypnosis and had become convinced that people with dissociative personality disorders uh, had actually been victimized by a worldwide conspiracy of uh, satanic practitioners. And this became part of their, uh, of their practices. It was a huge scandal. Hospitals paid millions of dollars in malpractice, in uh, liability settlements. And uh, so then the Diagnostic Statistical Manual version 4 was rewritten to take out the contributions of those people. Wow. Sanitize. So that's DSM-4 TR, text revision. Yeah. That's the story of that. Now what happened, the reason that this book became important was insurance policy companies looking for a way to figure out how to pay for insurance claims for mental health care use that book as their reference. Every possible condition that a person could have in mental health is given a five-digit code. Three digits, then a, a dot, and two additional digits, which modify it. For example, 311 is uh, major depression. Uh, the, uh, so if, you were, if there was a code that you could put down as your diagnosis, then the insurance company, well, they would know, okay, how much, how much are they going to pay for that, or what kind of treatments are they going to authorize? So the 
the, the DSM became a way of getting paid, which is why it became so important and basically took over uh, in mental health care. The problem is the book is totally unscientific. There isn't any philosopher of science who believes that book is scientifically valid. A buddy of mine, Harley Sears, uh, actually sent me this book, and it's called The Book of Woe by Gary Greenberg, G-R-E-E-N-B-E-R-G. It's the DSM and the unmaking of psychiatry. It's absolutely, it's a great book. If you're curious about it, pick it up. And this book kind of explicates the problems with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. See, what it does is it takes mental health problems that people have and classifies them according to their symptoms. Yeah, so here, let me, I'll try to, I'll try to show people really quick right off. So, like, I just flipped open, and luckily I got right, right to here. There's, so this is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and like Scott said, it's got this three digits, then a period, and then the two digits. So that's that diagnostic code, right, Scott? Right. And then underneath is all the criteria that I assume, if you're going to diagnose, you should be matching. Right. You have, to, you have to meet a certain number of the criteria that are listed to be able to make the diagnosis with validity. Now, the problem is, when you classify a condition by the basis of the symptom, you haven't really done anything that's important. In actual the practice of medicine, we would never do this. We would never say we're going to treat everyone with the same symptom the same. What we do is we look at the symptoms, we figure out what's causing the symptoms, and we treat that. We wouldn't say, for example, <clears throat> we got two, two guys in the emergency room, and they both got chest pain, so we're going to treat them exactly the same. Same drug, same treatment. Well, one guy's having a heart attack. The other guy was kicked in the chest by the mule. By a mule, they both got chest pains, but the reason for it is completely different. But it, it, what DSM does is it classifies everyone by their symptoms. So all people with depression are classified as a major depressive disorder, regardless of the fact of what's actually causing that depression which is why some depressions respond to one medication, not to others. Some respond to electroshock. Some don't respond to anything. Some respond to psychotherapy only. They're obviously different conditions, but they're given the same name because we categorize things by their symptom. But it goes so. further than that, doesn't it now, Scott? Because to connect what you've just explained to what you said earlier about coding things is how people now get paid. Now you have codes for symptoms which are like really some in some cases really really like everyday things. Right. Like when they, they set out the first revisional and they wanted professionals to look at it. I remember reading articles that I don't know if this made stayed in but there were codes for just like for literally overeating. Oh, there still is. There, there's right. a code just for overeating is a, diagno a diagnostic thing now. There's a code for caffeine-induced insomnia. <laughs> you can't get to sleep because you had too much coffee. That's codable. See how the book you held up, DSM-4 text revision, that's not the current version. Right. Just the last one. worried is since May we have DSM-5. Right. And DSM-5 represents a vast expansion of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. DSM-4-TR is a pretty big book, as you showed them. dsm is even bigger. There are many more diagnoses. And the criteria for making a diagnosis has been greatly reduced. It's much easier now to diagnose someone with, say, depression. In DSM-4, which you held up, there's a, an exclusion under depression for someone who's just suffered a bereavement. Your child died. And you can't be diagnosed as having a depression because you're upset because your child died. It's gone in DSM-5. 
If you're upset because your son has died or your daughter has died, you can now be diagnosed with major depression and you can be treated psychiatrically for that condition. So before, grief was not diagnosable, but now you're saying grief itself is, is now, diagnosable. Now, normal human sadness and suffering are diagnosable mental disorders. All right, so let's let's stay with that because that's a really great concrete example. So bridge for us how this affects the way we need to be aware and practice. If if someone comes to us and they're sad and they want help getting uplifted, getting motivated, getting out of a funk, as a lot of people would say, I feel stuck in a rut or I'm in a funk. How do we talk to them about this without making it seem like we're treating people? Exactly the point. And that's where consulting hypnotists consistently get into trouble. We use therapeutic and diagnostic language drawn from the diagnostic and statistical manual informally with our clients or in our records and then we can get nailed for the unlicensed practice of psychology or medicine or counseling or social work. Yeah, but okay, so just just like before, Scott, it was it was like you had to really make a boo-boo, right? Because if you if you were talking in the older days to someone and you were saying you could cure them of their phobia, then clearly you were you were overstepping your boundary. But now people can be diagnosed just for being sad. Like, how do I talk to them about that? That's, without... that's the thing. <laughs> now, everyone on this call, every member of the National Guild of Hypnotists should go to the Guild website, and this is a document you want to download. It's a free document. The Code of Ethics, Standards of Practice, and Recommended Terminology of the National Guild of Hypnotists. You definitely want to have this in your office. Code of Ethics, Standards of Practice, Helpful Advice. Well, Code of Ethics is not advice. You've got to do that stuff. But the terminology, what we did is we assembled a panel of, of, of blue ribbon hypnotic practitioners, the best of the best. And we said, create a language for the professional practice of the hypnotic arts and sciences that lets a practitioner say everything they need to say but does not trespass on the protected language of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And the terminology is in that, that, that document I just held up. That's what you should be using in your conversations with your clients. That's what you should be putting in your records. Every year we get about a dozen hypnotists who get cease and desist orders because they got careless and they started advertising that they work with depression or anxiety or phobias or post-traumatic stress disorder. They used the protected language of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and they were promptly nailed for the unlicensed practice of psychology. If it's in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, you've got to be a licensed healthcare professional to be able to use that language. Period. Now the problem is that some of that language has gotten into common discourse. The person will come in and say, I feel depressed today. They don't mean that they meet seven of the twelve criteria of the diagnostic and statistical. They mean they feel sad. They'll say they feel anxious because they, they, they feel worried. They'll say they have an eating disorder when they mean they want to take off ten pounds. They don't mean the words in the formal sense, but they're using the words from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And if you use those words, you create a vulnerability for yourself, because a judge has no way of knowing whether you're using them formally or informally. The judge is just going to say you can't use them at all. And that's the problem. So we need to use the guild terminology for the hypno for hypnotic practice, not the words from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So, for example, a client comes to you and says, well, I'm depressed. I might ask, well, have you been diagnosed by a, uh, 
a doctor or a psychologist or anyone else as having depression. No. Well, then there's no diagnosis. That person is using the word informally. So I'll say, I'll be happy to work with you to restore a positive mental attitude, to overcome your sadness, to get you back on the right track, to help you become happy again. The words that come out of my mouth are the words that I'm regulated by, and I don't use the diagnostic language back. Now, if he says, I've been diagnosed by a psychiatrist as having depression, well, that's different. Now I'm going to want to have a note from the psychiatrist or something like that, or I'm going to be very, very careful about what work I agree to do with this person because I don't want to inadvertently trespass on the protected practice of another profession. But if there's been no diagnosis and a person is using the words informally, I just restate it in the form of the guild terminology, and we go on from there. And there is nothing in my records that's going to get me in trouble. There's nothing in my website that's going to get me in trouble, or my brochure, or my advertising. That's what you've got to do. In the next Journal of Hypnotism, my article on legislative and governmental concerns will be about obesity. Some of you may have heard that obesity has just been now reclassified as a disease. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's a disease, only licensed healthcare professionals can work with it. Right. So what does that mean for us? It means we can't offer to treat obesity, but we can do weight control. We can do weight management. We can do, you know, healthy eating, exercise motivation. We can do improve your, your weight or improve your physical appearance. We can do all of those but we can't use the word obesity. That's now a formal protected word that we have to avoid. It's always the case. The words that come out of your own mouth or the words you write down on paper are the words that can get you in trouble or solve all your problems. That help? Good question. <laughs> Mark, go ahead. Yeah, uh, to, to Charles, what about we talk about BMI, body mass index, or things that are about obesity. Can we, can we use, what, what termino terminology can we use? Well, we, we can certainly talk about a person's body mass index. Right. Uh, and, you know, there's a generally accepted criteria that if you're below 25, you're fine. If you're between 25 and 30, you're overweight. If you're, if you're 50 or above, you're, you're morbidly obese. But those aren't diagnostic terms. Gotcha. So from general, general consensus terms. For example, a football player may have a body max index of 40, but is not in any sense obese. It's all muscle. So that's not an absolute thing. We can use the body mass index. We can use blood pressure. We can use blood sugar. But we can't use diagnostic language drawn from the protected manuals of the American Psychiatric Association. That's the key. Thanks. And you know, every year I get these the uh, colleagues who get in trouble because they've done this, and you know, they contact me and say, "How could you let this happen?" And I look at their materials, and they've been ignoring everything the guild has said about safe and lawful practice. Well, what we do is we'll help them clean up their practice and get them out of trouble that way. But they could have avoided the whole trip if they just carefully used the guild non-therapeutic language. There is no safe way for an unlicensed person to practice hypnotism except the National Guild of Hypnotist Way. So, so do, Scott, do I, oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, just, just to follow up to that, I guess, should I change the, uh, the, the text on my website and, be, and remove the word obesity? I would. Okay. I would. I mean, you can do weight control, you can do weight management, you can do weight improvement, you can do exercise motivation, you can do anything but obesity. But if you've got obesity, you're offering to treat a disease and you better be licensed to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. So there's, there's um, it, it seems like based on what you're saying, Scott, there's there's sort of two levels of this that, that people need to be you aware of. Get out in the sunshine. Um, on, on one level, it's... Um, not actually at first, based on what you're saying. <laughs> here, here go my dogs. Um, <laughs> I 
is what happens when my mailman comes. Um, so on the one level, there's. Oh, I'm sorry about. It's about how they're putting themselves out there before they even meet people. You're saying it's about websites and pamphlets and the language people are crafting to sort of try to get business in the first place. Absolutely. And then there's that second layer of creating the impression when you're working with a client that you are diagnosing them somehow. Right. You, we are not allowed to diagnose, treat, nor prescribe. And you must not use language that sounds like you're doing that. And you must not seem to be offering that service to the public, which is why you're going to be a lot better off avoiding the diagnosis. Someone asked someone asked for you. Here, here, here. My dogs my are going crazy because the next door neighbor's kids are coming out my door. So you guys ask some questions. questions. Go ahead. So would I have a question? Have a question? Okay, what I'm hearing is your high voice coming back, back in the computer. Here. So someone's so got a driver back on the phone. Yeah, we've got an echo. All right, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, anybody else have a question? No one else has questions. Well, well, Paul, to give you an example, the document I'm giving you up right now, this is the, uh, uh, the Illinois law for that allows us to practice here in Illinois. This is an exemption to the Clinical Psychology License Act that we, put, we passed in 1996. And what this does is this exempts us from regulation uh, as psychologists. But listen to what it says about the practice of clinical psychology. This is the definition. And this is common wording in almost every state. Clinical psychology means the independent evaluation, classification, and treatment of mental, emotional, behavioral, or nervous disorders or conditions, developmental disabilities, alcoholism and substance abuse, disorders of habit or conduct, the psychological aspects of physical illness. The practice of clinical psychology includes psychoeducational evaluation, therapy, remediation, and consultation, the use of psychological and neuropsychological testing, assessment, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, hypnosis, biofeedback, and behavioral modification when any of these are used for the purpose of preventing or eliminating psychopathology or for the amelioration of psychological disorders of individuals or groups. And then we have the wonderful sentence that we added. Clinical psychology does not include the use of hypnosis by unlicensed persons. Person to section 3, which goes on to define practicing in accordance with the Guild standard. So all of those words that you heard, if you're claiming to be treating psychopathology, you have to be licensed as a clinical psychologist. So don't do that if you're not licensed as a clinical psychologist. Use the Guild language instead and you'll be fine. We've had the Guild language now for 10 years. In those 10 years, there has not been a single consulting hypnotist, not one, who has gotten into trouble using that language. All of the cases that have crossed my desk have been cases of people who used language drawn from the, from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual instead. So for me, this is a no-brainer. And I practice that way. I'm a board-certified chaplain. Under Illinois law, that makes me a health care provider. I could use the diagnostic terminology legally. I don't. I don't use it in my website, my brochures, or with my clients. And I've got a great big full practice. I work with hospitals and wellness centers. I get referrals from physicians all the time. You don't have to do that stuff to be successful. Yeah, I think that's a really important. I think it's a really important point. Um, all right. So just to uh, for anyone who joined us late. Um, uh, 
what Scott's referring to is the National Guild of Hypnotists has created a code of ethics um, and uh, resource guide which you can get from their website. So if you go to www.ngh.net slash legislation slash download hyphen center, that's the page where you can grab that download and it gives you the recommended terminology and the guidelines that will help you stay out of trouble. And that's a wonderful resource. It every single year to be sure that it's current. Yeah, great. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, any other questions from folks who are sort of in our studio audience? Any of you have questions for Scott? No? Yes. Yes. Can, you use, can you use the word stress? Stress is fine. Okay. How about sleep? Sleep is fine. Just don't use insomnia. Right, right. Gotcha. That's what I was asking about. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I had someone, Scott, earlier, um, and, and I and I already heard you reference it, but we'll clarify. I did have someone who messaged me and said, I can't be here today, but could you please ask about the use of the word anxiety? Don't use it. That's a protected word. Okay. Use worry instead. It's worry. not anxiety. It's worry. It's not depression. It's sadness. It's not phobia. It's fear. It's not obsession. It's being driven. Use our language. And we even have recommended language for describing popular hypnotic techniques, like regression. Our definition for that is an imaginative review of significant events with the hypnotist serving as guide. Easy. Sounds simple. No judge is going to look at that and say this is psychotherapy. But you look at some of the definitions that some practitioners come up with, it sounds like they're doing psychoanalysis. And I, and I do think um, there's a tendency in our professional community for people to get a little caught up sometimes and, and to, um, to, to want to sort of take credit for having that level of, of achievement or influence with people. I've routinely at the convention heard people talking about the work they're doing and every year I hear someone um, say a phrase like I'm a healer right they, they like to you know and, and I get why they're saying it but I, that's what it makes me feel like think about how this is how you get into trouble when you start okay. thinking about the work we do in that way and and it's you know it's just stuff well and you know the thing it is it's the hypnosis is the client's work, not ours. We don't do anything to the client when we hypnotize them. The client's doing that to themselves. Healing is the client's work. If the client heals, that's something the client did, not something that we did. We may have showed them how to mobilize their natural healing power. Right. But we didn't we're not a healer in the yeah. same sense. Uh, you hear this all the time. I hear it too. I win side. You know, I, there's only you can't tell people what they don't want to hear. So we 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 put it out there. We we tell you what you have to do. If you just won't hear it, you know, we're not here to carry you in from out of the ring. But if you get in trouble, you're on your own. You know, uh, if you, if you go our way. We know it will work. Whenever the guild develops something, whether it's like the title consulting hypnotist, the recommended terminology, the standards of practice, we don't just make this stuff up. We, we assemble a team of competent people. It take, it, the terminology took us two years to put together. We field test it. We do test marketing. We know it works. And the fact is, in 10 years, not been a single cease and desist order. All the cease and desist orders have been going to the people who are treating trauma and depression and anxiety and phobias and all the things we say not to do. Uh, a question to that point. Sure, Mark. How, how is that being policed? I mean, we talk about terminology. Who's policing these terms? You're you know, being policed by the, by the regulatory boards in your state. Okay, I'm in those California. Are people, those are the people who have a vested financial interest in seeing that you don't use their protected terminology. And they will they hire people to check your ads. They also hire what are called shoppers. Shoppers yeah. are people who are paid to go to your office and pretend to be a client. 
Right. Often they're they're law students, or they get academic credit for this as well as uh, uh, being paid a, a stipend, and they'll pretend to be a client. What they're trying to do is to get you to say something you shouldn't say. Okay. And they're probably wired, and they're recording it, and the cease and desist order will arrive about two weeks later. My own practice has been shot that I know of twice. Gotcha. As the Illinois Psychology Board sends someone here pretending to be a client, and to see if I was, uh, if they they could find something to stop me, wow. and they couldn't. Thank Even you. though in my case. They, they, they hadn't gone the extra step and checked all my credentials to realize I could have done it and it would have been fine, but I don't. There's also uh, talk of all these PhDs, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, there's, as far as the uh, validity of, of the suffixes, people putting out the, at the end of their name, you know, about these. Uh, the, the unaccredited PhDs, yeah. Right? Exactly. I totally agree. I mean, Hypno, hypnotherapy or hypnotism is not an, a, a, an actual academic uh, field in, uh, for any anywhere in the United States. So if you see someone with a PhD in, in hypnotherapy, <clears throat> it is not an accredited degree. Period. And there, I, I think when I see someone using those degrees, it, it just speaks to their character. They're trying to pretend that they're something they're not. I hold a doctorate doctoral degree. It's an accredited doctoral degree. I learned in four years of residential full-time graduate study. That's gotcha. what it took me to earn that doctoral degree. And you get someone who writes five book reports and pays a few thousand dollars to some school in rural Louisiana or, you know, uh, in uh, Uganda and gets a PhD they put after their name and they claim they're the same as the same level of education as me. No, they're not. But also, these degrees don't help you. Uh, maybe 20 years ago, you could get you could get some traction out of them. But you know, it takes only a few minutes now with a smartphone for someone to Google your school and discover that it's not academically accredited. It, 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 it just isn't worth doing, Thank in you. my opinion. All Anyone right. else have anything? Anything else? I think you. I think when you you talked about, you know, kind of stating how simple it is in terms of just following that language guide, Scott. It seems like it sort of made everyone go, "Oh, okay." <laughs> I just, you know, wrapped it up. So, um, I mean, if people do have questions, feel free. But I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to keep you all here. If um, you know, we don't need to be. And I know Scott's got another client to get to in a little while. But um, <clears throat> you know, and I and I don't. If you have a question, please ask it. But uh, you know, obviously, if it comes down to language questions, it's consult the guide, right? So there's no right. point in your absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what else? Everyone else comfortable? Well, Paul, then I really thank you for doing this. It's, it's no, a, thank you. You're thank you. This is great. Work, so I'm not going to have cease and desist orders at landing on my desk with some of these people. Hopefully, right? That's that's the goal. Is hopefully we can uh, we can get this out. And please, folks. Um, uh, we'll post this in the hypnosis community here on Google uh, Plus. We'll post the replay, and please, by all means, share it. Get it out to your colleagues. Um, you know, get it out. Put it on your. If you write a blog, put it on your blog. Whatever you can do, just to get this out, so that maybe people will spend a little time reviewing it and and sort of get their head around how simple yet important this issue is. And uh, hopefully, we can help keep each other uh, out of sticky situations and and just help each other out. So. Thank Scott, you. thanks again so much. I really appreciate it. It was kind of you. Thank you. Okay. Take care, folks. Thank you for joining right. me. Thanks, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks, Paul. All right. All right. Thank All right. you.